It's now, um, it's now absolutely our pleasure to welcome Andrew B Andy Burnham, who, uh, I mean, if anything, needs even less introduction than uh, Jeremy Hunt did, because of Andy, of course, was Health Secretary for the final 11 months of uh, La Labour's long period in power, and he's now been Labour's health spokesman in opposition for almost two and a half years. Uh, he's made it clear that if Labour win the next election, he will repeal Andrew Lansley's mighty 2012 Health and Social Care Act, that we might explore in questions a little more precisely what that means. And he's just see, received the report of the Oldham Commission, which uh, uh, Labour created, on how to get to the much better integrated or coordinated or whole person care that we spent part of the morning talking about. So there'll be loads to talk about. Andy, do come and... Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm tempted to begin by asking uh, whether you enjoyed my warm-up act, my warm-up man. I don't know, a uh, <laughs> bit, bit provocative to start that way, isn't it, I guess? So, uh, um, less, uh, less helpfully, I gather I uh, have been billed today uh, by an earlier speaker as um, one of the foremost purveyors of glutinous sentimentality about the, um, <laughs> about the NHS. It's a very big billing indeed. I hope I don't, dis hope I don't disappoint in... Uh, <laughs> What I'm about to say, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, but actually, to be honest, it's the opposite that I've been doing uh, these four or so years uh, of opposition. I've been taking a very unsentimental look at things, uh, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, because I have to. I mean, opposition has a, if it has a purpose, it's often a thankless, uh, a thankless job at times. It feels like that. Um, obviously, there's the job of uh, attacking and holding to account the, the current incumbents. <laughs> But if it has a, a constitutional purpose, a deeper one, then it, it is that, um, that pause for deep reflection on policy, to really take a, a hard, critical look at the way things are, and to examine and challenge thinking uh, in every, on every level. And that, that is what I've been doing uh, in opposition. Uh, it's helped by the fact that I am a shadow of my former self, as uh, Nick was uh, saying. <laughs> So I have that knowledge of having worked in the department. So that does give you an you know, a, a absolutely crucial perspective on things. And really, I mean, I've looked in, in detail at three things, or thought carefully about three things. Our own policy record as a government and what we achieved, you know, of which I remain intensely proud. I um, will continue to remind people that we left an NHS with the lowest ever waiting lists, the highest ever public satisfaction. Uh, it wasn't achieved by Labour politicians alone. That was achieved by the collective efforts of many people in this room and beyond. Uh, it uh, turned round the fortunes of, of the NHS, I think, as the Secretary of State was kind enough to acknowledge. Uh, and it was uh, a period of renewal for the NHS. But we didn't get everything right. Of course we didn't. Uh, and I've been thinking deeply uh, about that. Uh, of course, I have to look at the current policy, the current path on which the NHS is placed, and I have a, a number of concerns about that, uh, and that has to come into my thinking in terms of what I do uh, next. And then the third area I've got to look at is the future, this century that we're in, the questions it is asking of our, not just our health system, but our health and care system. And I think it's asking questions that that system is increasingly struggling to answer to the public's satisfaction. Uh, and that really is the kind of crux of the challenge before us. So when I've kind of taken this stand back and I've looked, looked at the system, you might ask, well, what did I, what did I see? What do, what do I kind of find when I, when I take this uh, unsympathetic look at the system? What I see is a 20th century model of care that is, is struggling and actually is on the point that it's in danger of being uh, over, overwhelmed. I see a medical model of care, predominantly, that isn't actually equipped, geared up, to, to aspire to provide to the people of this country a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. I don't think it is geared up to do that. I see a system that is, doesn't work in partnership enough with the other services that, that determine health, housing, employment, education, 
too, in, too much in its own silo, but also highly fragmented within. Fragmented uh, between primary and secondary care, physical and mental uh, care, certainly council and NHS, but, but even so, even within the health service, you know, very specialist, too specialist, you might even say, highly focused on body parts, specialisms, and really doesn't, in my view, put sufficient premium on what good generalist care is. Hasn't done that enough. So that's, that's what I see. But if you then bring it down to people, what does it, what does it mean for people? You know, I, I see a service and a system that isn't delivering what people and families are, are looking for. You know, what is the end result of that fragmentation that I described a moment ago? The result of that, to the average person in my constituency, is telling the same story to everybody who comes through the door. All of those different disconnected encounters with professionals of different kinds, the kind of battle they face to coordinate care between the council, between the NHS. You know, for the public, that just doesn't make sense to say to them, oh, the council deals with this bit of your mum over here and the NHS does that bit over there. It doesn't make sense and it leads to real frustration and a service that actually doesn't really uh, provide for all of one person's uh, needs is, is highly fragmented. And, and is the question then, of course, we have to ask is, is that, is that sustainable? And I, I don't believe it is. If I look then at current policy, if I, if I then say, well, bring, th these are the fundamentals that have been there in the system for many, many years. The change in demographics has brought out the cracks in the system. We've, the cracks have become more visible as we've all got older. But I think current policy is, is really now driving the NHS towards the cliff edge. It's on an unsustainable path, in my view, and it really is heading quite quickly towards a serious, uh, a serious collapse. Why? I think if you look at the disparity between health and social care, health so-called protected, debate to be had about that, but so local government and social care, certainly not. So we see uh, the analysis from Age Concern in uh, the news today that over the last decade, 800,000 people have lost basic support in the home. You know, the, the help of daily living, getting up and about, washed, getting washed, getting dressed, getting fed, basic preventative support in that social space. And that is the NHS's problem. The NHS can't say, oh, that's councils, we don't. We're seeing now the consequences of that in a change, in my view, in A&E, where we're seeing that sustained year-round pressure in A&E, building, building, building. That's because hospitals are increasingly full. I think the current, uh, the current path that we're on is, in, in effect, a plan for the hospitalisation of ever numbers, of the greater numbers of older people. That is what is happening. As simple support is taken away in the home, as a society, we seem to be happy to spend thousands of pounds keeping an ever-increasing number of older people in, uh, in acute hospitals, often the worst place for them to be, where they may have their immediate physical needs looked after, but their social and mental needs are often uh, neglected, and hence older people can often drop like a stone in that acute hospital uh, environment. That's, that's as I see it at the moment. This is the path that the current system uh, is on. And I believe it will hit the buffers in a serious way uh, quite soon if we don't wake up to what is, what is happening. I don't see a system that is going to provide the standards of care that you would want for your parents, and I certainly want for mine. Indeed, we should aspire as a society for, ev to ev for everybody's parents. This isn't a political point. This is a point I would put to governments of all colours, all political parties. Over decades, we have allowed the social care system in England to be degraded. And 
it has become, in the end, well, you get what you pay for, don't you? And what have we got? A malnourished minimum wage system that is dishing out care in these 15-minute slots by young people, often, on zero-hours contracts who don't even get paid for the travel time between the 15-minute visits. That is not going to provide the quality of care in people's homes that we're going to need if we're going to relieve pressure on our, our hospitals and if we're going to spend public money to best effect. But on a, on a human level, how can somebody who doesn't have the basic security of knowing what they're going to earn from one week to the next, how can they possibly pass on a sense of security to the vulnerable uh, people that they work for? H how are we going to build a 21st century care system when the message we're sending out to people who choose to work in this system that looking after somebody else's parents is basically the lowest of the low, the lowest calling that you can answer in society. I, I just don't believe we can achieve anything like the level of care we want when, we're having, when that is the current approach uh, to care. As I say, not the current fault of this current government exclusively, but certainly made worse by their approach to local government uh, funding. So what do we do about it? And that then brings me on to, 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 where, uh, to where we go. Before I kind of, you, you obviously will have a sense of where I'm going in terms of my uh, policy um, solution. But before I talk to you about it, I just want to kind of say some of the things that have, I've been wrestling with uh, over the last year, and, and indeed, Sir John Oldham has, and the commission we established on whole person care, which reported this week. I knew it would have been irresponsible in the extreme if I were to come forward now and say, and you know, what we need is another reorganisation to deliver a new policy. Now, you are sick to the back teeth, I am absolutely certain, of people like me coming along uh, with the assumption that a new policy requires new organisations. Of course it doesn't. And yet, that has happened in the NHS over many years. So I'm, I am aware that I am inheriting a kind of a situation where cynicism is high about people like me, uh, but also the situation is urgent. And that is quite a complicated uh, policy context in which to work. And I know that the NHS simply doesn't have the wherewithal, the capacity. You know, I, I think it's... A, it, its capacity is pretty degraded, actually, after what has been, in my view, an unnecessary round of reorganisation. I think it's in a, a weak and fairly confused position at the moment, as people are still struggling to make sense of the, the, the new landscape that's being created. I know that if I were to come forward with another reorganisation, that would, as I say, be irresponsible in the extreme. I've also got to look at the reality in local government, because that, of course... The NHS can't just say, oh, that's councils, that's nothing to do with us. It is to do with us, because if councils aren't providing basic support for people, that problem ends up on the door of the acute hospital, and then that acute hospital can't function because those older people can't go home again. The NHS is showing signs, in my view, of beginning to jam up. A&E is the barometer of the whole health and care system. And if you look at what that barometer is telling us, it's telling us that there are severe storms just ahead or, or here now, because the pressure is simply not relenting. And that is telling us that there's, there's problems building across this whole health and care system. So I've had to kind of work, you know, I've had to kind of be conscious of all of that. And I've uh, also kind of had to look at what happened last time, you know, that uh, minutes after a general election, a, a new policy dumped on an unsuspecting system. Well, that can't happen again, ever, in my view. You know, we, we have to... Uh, ensure that if any change is to be done, it is done collectively, with people buying into it. And that is what I hope I'm about to, uh, to, to, to show you. Well, this is, uh, this is it. This is the report of um, the, the Commission on Whole Person Care uh, by Sir John Oldham and his commission. And we are, from an opposition point of view, immensely grateful uh, to him. A couple of things to say about it. Firstly, you know, this, this is the vision, this is what I believe in, this is what I want to do. And it's the product of, as I say, careful, careful reflection about all of the things I've been talking about uh, in the opening section of my remarks today. I've tried to 
take on board all of those worries that people have about the current ability of the system to accept change. Now, John, has, in my view, has done two very important things for us, and let me, let me just describe what they, what they are. The first is he's given us a route map here to the full integration of health and social care, but without a structural reorganisation. I can work with the organisations I inherit. Simply, we will give them a new job to do. And unlike the last reorganisation, this will have a very clear uh, goal, whole person care. A single service that is able to see all of one person's needs. That's the simplest way I could put it. Or in another way, to, re to reset the NHS at the start of the 21st century as, as an NHS for the whole person able to provide much better care for any people with multiple or ongoing needs. And that's not just frail elderly people. Everyone will, will always see this debate through that prism because of that's the pressure that is most evident on the front line of the NHS. But I am talking here about children with complex needs, adults with, with disabilities. Uh, it, it is about caring differently for people uh, who need who need that, uh, that support. So firstly, we've got a route map here to build the system we want without reorganisation. But the second thing that the Oldham uh, report does is, is of you know, much more radical significance. If you open your mind to a world where social is brought together with physical and mental, you create the conditions for something truly radical to happen. And what is that? You create the possibility of the true personalization of care. And that's what this is. This is a blueprint for the full and true personalization of care. People have used that word. But in my view, it will never be a reality in a system where one part of it is dealing with people's mental needs, another part is dealing with people's physical needs, and an entirely different bit is responsible for people's social needs. It's only when you take away those barriers, when you have a single service that can see the whole person and all of their needs, that I think you then can rethink fundamentally what good care is in the 21st century. When you can change the default setting for care from the hospital to where it needs to be, the home. That is what becomes possible. Because the social has never been in the NHS settlement, the home has always been, well, that's not where we, where we are, the NHS. We wait when people fail at home. That's, we come in to pick up the pieces after people have failed. Well, that, that won't work anymore. That can't work anymore, that mentality. We have to have a system that starts in people's homes and in a highly integrated preventative way, builds a single team of support around those people to provide the care that they want. Not doing to them, but actually give them what they are asking for, highly personalised, a solution for them, in agreement with them, and also in agreement with their informal and family carers. Those people who are utterly invisible to the system at the moment, well, that can't carry on for certain. They have got to be centre stage in this new system and you have to des design solutions for people and families where they want to be, surrounded by the people they love in their own home. And it's only when you can see, when you have a single service that can see the whole person, that you can begin to aspire to care that is that personalised. If you're working within the current medical model, you can never get there because you can't see the the whole person. It's not funded in that way. And to make this real, you know, we've got to spell out what it means for people. You know, that is where it's got to be, isn't it? Not what it means for structures and organisations. What does it mean for people? And then organisations and structures are going to have to fit in to deliver it. That's the right order of things. So for people, you know, I would want to give the public powerful new rights to pull the system in this direction. So, let me give you an illustration of what they may be. You know, it's about saying, rather than a system that uses, overuses targets that in the end have the effect of empowering managers, 
if we're going to make the shift to a, a person-centred system, and I use that phrase rather than a patient-centred, a person-centred system, a social model rather than a medical model, then I think we're going to need powerful rights for people to get what they want from, uh, from, the, uh, from the service, from the single service. So, let me give you an illustration. That might be the right to a single point of contact for the coordination of all care. Just imagine that simple, simple thing. But imagine what a step forward that is for the person who lives away from mum and dad, working in London in their 50s, 60s, getting worried now about their care when they're away from, when they can't be where they grew up with their mum or dad. Imagine what that would mean for them if they could pick up the phone or email one person who would then correct any problems or sort out any gaps in, in that support. It would mean the right to have an assessment of your carer's needs. Again, if that was done up front, what a, what a huge change that would, that would be. It could be the right to social and mental support in any setting, such as the acute hospital. Again, huge reassurance to the public who fear that if mum or dad goes into hospital, they may go downhill. But then crucially, the right to care in a place of that individual's choosing. So that might mean dialysis, chemo, in the home rather than the hospital. Or it might mean um, giving birth at home. Or fundamentally, ending one's life at home. If we were to have a system that was truly person-centred, that is what it should be able to give everybody if that is what they if that is what they wanted. And while the last government was right to talk about the importance of choice, I think we have to recognise, those of us who were involved in the last government, that we often ended up giving people choices that they weren't asking for. They didn't often have a strong view about which organisation they would go to for a hip operation, but they had incredibly strong views about where and how their care uh, should, be, uh, should be delivered. So this is a vision based on the true personalisation of care. And it's a pretty simple but quite radical thought for parts of our civil service that if you actually give the public up front what they are asking for, it may actually cost much less in the long run. And that is a simple but, quite honestly, very alien notion to the current, the current way we provide things. These silos are set at national level. And I know that from somebody who tried to reform social care in the last government. We create these divides at the very top between the physical, the mental, the social. And that then cascades all the way down to the ground. And it builds a system that can't see the whole person and therefore can't personalise the care it offers. Now, that has to change. The luxury of silo-based working is something we can't afford anymore. Be a load of questions about Fine. that. Fine. I'll just finish on this point then, Nick. I, I, I appreciate that uh, you want to get into questions. So let me just finish on, the, on this last point. What this means, of course, though, is the system growing into a... I want the system to have space to grow into a different organisation that can deliver this. It crucially depends on the integration of commissioning, number one, and then the integration of provision, number two. So, yes, a single budget for all care, a year of care budget for individuals with complex needs. I think the best place for that is under the Health and Wellbeing Board. Secondly, the integration of provision. And I think all barriers need to be removed from that. And this is a change. I don't believe the market gets you there. I don't believe the market is the answer to 21st century care. The market, in the end, delivers increasing cost, increasing complexity, increasing fragmentation. I want the existing system to have the space to grow into integrated care organisations. The DGH, operating from home to hospital, providing this full spectrum of care, physical, mental and social. And if that makes me sentimental about the NHS, then, then to be honest, that's, I don't mind admitting it. Because I believe an NHS that is based on the notion of people before profits is actually an ideal worth fighting for. That is what people trust. But I'm not so sentimental to think that that system won't survive if it doesn't fundamentally change how it thinks and works. If we're to protect that ideal, that is essential. 
or it will not be able to meet modern standards. I believe I have a plan to make that happen, and I look forward to any of your questions about it. Thank you for listening. Do you, do you want to sit or stand? You can't I'll see stand. anything. Sure, I'll stand there. Yeah. Uh, questions? Any hands up? Uh, while you are contemplating, and you say you build this on existing yep. organisations, yep. right? And that your health, the health and wellbeing boards will evolve into the main commissioner. But I mean, that's a huge shift in accountability. It doesn't actually, in practice, amount to another reorganisation that you can see from space. Because the, you know, the TCGs will get this empowered, yep. the local authorities have a very different role. I mean, it is, in fact, a big reorganisation, even though you're, you know, labelling it, well, using an existing label. Well, what I would say to that, Nick, is that this isn't me coming up with a new thing that I'm trying to persuade everybody about. People are doing... The, this is the way people are going on the ground across England. Mm. Councils and NHS in different communities are, are realising now that they really can't carry on kind of operating separately. They realise that they'll all, everybody will lose if we do that. So people are, doing, are beginning to do it. They're on a journey. And the first thing I would say about this, and this is very much where John has helped shape my thinking, is that I'm talking here about a 10-year journey. You know, this is, you're right, Nick, it's about culture, it's about relationships. But people are moving in this direction. And I see it all over the country, much greater synthesis between health and wellbeing boards, CCGs, a, a different conversation taking place than I've ever seen, to be honest, in my uh, 13 or so years in Parliament. And that is why this has a chance, because it's not me coming along saying, oh, here's a new agenda I'm dumping on you and you've all got to do this now. People are doing this, are beginning to move in this direction. What I want to do is send them the, the, the biggest of green lights that I possibly can. And John comes up with a fairly elegant solution in the report, saying that, yeah, you wouldn't just hand over everything to a health and wellbeing board, but if they have got the capacity and they've shown that they can, then they could take over a single budget more, more quickly. If you look in my area, Greater Manchester, AGMA, the councils, are one of the strongest parts of the public sector, incredibly capable. And I think for colleagues in the health service, we have to change our mindset to start saying people's health is critically linked to their housing, mm. critically linked to their housing, to their community, to their employment or lack of to their children's education. These are the determinants of health, and we cannot run anymore, in my view, a narrow medical model of commissioning and expecting that to solve the health of the nation. It won't. We have to start building housing that is built with the kind of expectation that care, that is a place where care will be provided. And until we get that alignment in policy thinking at local level, Honestly, I don't think we will wake up to the challenges that the right. 21st century is bringing to our door. Right. Can I just ask one other thing? The single budget you talk about, does that still come through the current channels? So at the moment, you have, a, you have the health budget, which is ring-fenced, goes through DH, and you have the social care budget, which is not ring-fenced, and is made up of a complex mixture of grants from different bits of government departments and some council tax, maybe, and a bit of the other. Or, or, or are you envisaging one single budget for health and social care that will be delivered centrally? I, I mean, there's a number of ways in which this can be done. I think the crux of it is, is breaking away from the thinking that, well, this is our budget. You know, we're, we're putting a bit of it into this pooled mm. system, but it's still ours. And I think that is the thinking in the end that's got to go. The current system is riven by these divides, primary v secondary, yeah. you know, physical v mental, council v NHS, and that, that is meaningless to the public. The public couldn't give a bugger about these divides. They want the best care that can be delivered, and they don't really have a view about all of those things. Yep. The crux of it is that it's only when you take away this thing that, you know, the, the problem we have, that if the NHS says, well, we're, we're investing, so therefore, oh, and the councils get the benefit, you, you're always going to have that kind of, kind of conflict at mm -hmm. local level unless you start thinking of a single budget. And I mm -hmm. think the quicker people embrace that, the more they will unlock savings and the more they will redesign services more, more quickly. If people try to hold on to those things, then I think, in the end, they won't make the changes that they need. Yep. But a single budget, Nick, just to, just to kind of finish off with this point, could then, what flows from that is then a year of care, simplicity in a year of care approach for not just physical and mental needs, but social needs too. 
And that then puts you in a different ball game, in my view. That then creates the incentive for the home, not the hospital, to be the default setting for care. And I think it's only then that you really are playing on a different pitch then and you're able to, to do different things. Right. Question there. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Burnham, uh, my name's uh, Tim Richardson. I was a GP in Epsom until a year ago and now retired. I would vote for you on a lot of what you said about healthcare. And I saw in my last year before I retired as chair of a commissioning group that actually the Health and Wellbeing Board would probably be a better commissioner and be able to do that joined up thinking that you're talking about with their share of the social care spend put into the capitated yeah. arrangement. And I was very much in favor of uh, the ICO idea that came up at the end of Darcy that was sitting on your desk yeah. and unfortunately undone. And see GPs much better, uh, along with other healthcare professionals as providers, than sitting around uh, CCG commissioning tables. But there are two things that actually I think you need to consider. One is that if you're going to get this huge transition of care out of um, hospitals, what are we going to do with the hospitals? There's going to be what there has always been, MPs, I'm not sure whether you've ever stood at the barricades like our, your predecessor here this afternoon did once upon a time. And the other is that to get the infrastructure into primary and community services, these services cannot be provided purely from current GP premises, many of which will be deemed unsuitable or unfit when inspected in due course. You're going to have to rely on private sector funding because your government, the, pre the current government, do not have the funding to put in the huge infrastructure needed to create this out-of-hospital solution. Well, thank you very much uh, for what you said. And uh, I will absolutely agree with you. I mean, everything in, implicit in everything I've said is that hospitals are going to have to change and change pretty significantly. But I want to see that done in, in an evolutionary way where they have stability, financial stability, to embrace change. So if a, if a hospital-based organi organisation was to receive the year of care, it would then have financial stability to be able to kind of begin to plan how it was going to change. And please don't read into that you know, monopolistic provision. Those will have heard what I said about the market not being the answer. That's not the same thing as saying that whole person care is going to have to be delivered in every community between a partnership, a trusted partnership, between public, voluntary and private. I mean, that's, that's going to have to continue to be the reality. I think the best way to do that is to have long-term relationships based on trust where, I mean, the, the report talks of alliance contracting. You could come up with different phrases for it. That, in my view, is going to be the answer. But allow hospitals to kind of, with the stability beneath them, to kind of embrace different ways of thinking where it's, nothing is an existential threat to their existence, which often it is at the moment when things are, things are coming along in this very primary v secondary uh, model. So th that is where I see it. And people immediately think, well, oh, are they going to be brave enough to do that? Well, you know, look at places where it's happened, where they've gone down this path, Torbay. They get a lot of praise, but rightly so, in my view, because they did embrace this sooner. It wasn't the A&E or the maternity that had to go. It was the general medical beds that they were able to, to, to lose. You know, they lost 200 or so general medical beds when they went down this path of much higher standard care in people's homes. And that is something that I, I don't think people will be marching in the streets for more general medical beds for older people. That is, in my view, the way to go. You, know, you be, allow the organisations to migrate into a different, a different world. And for the GP, just let me say this, I think it's about empowering the GP to be at the centre of that multidisciplinary team, operating within a social rather than a medical model. I want the GP not just to have the option, just the medical solutions for people, antidepressants, whatever. The GP should be able to pay to get people what they need, the walk-in shower, the, they, they should be empowered to give people personalised solutions that are going to work for those people. And I think that actually could be quite um, invigorating for, for general practice. There's two, could the microphone go there, back there? Sorry, to, well, there's two hands up next to each other. Sorry, I've got the mic. I can't see those. Yeah. Light, actually. Sorry, it's Sophia Christie. Um, you spoke with real passion about the degradation of social care. Yeah. over the last 10 years. Can you say a bit more about what you'd hope to do to address that if you came back into power? Well, th thank you, and I'm, I'm pleased actually you picked up on that, because a lot of what I talk about is born out of personal experience in terms of what happened to my, my grandmother in, in the system. And uh, can, can 
compromise and yeah. add a rider to that, yeah. doesn't it mean more money? Well, well, not necessarily. I mean, I think the first thing to say about this, when people, some people look at the Olden Report and say, oh, this all looks very well, but what about more money? Can anyone in this room, anyone in this room, look the public in the eye in your area where you, where you work and say that the current system is spending every pound that taxpayers put into the NHS and the care system to best effect? It's simply not possible to do that, is it? Because for the want of spending a few pounds in people's homes on that decent social care support, grab rail, walk in shower, we're spending thousands of pounds on hospitalisation. And that isn't best value for what the public are currently giving us. I see it to be honest, as a journey where the NHS can begin to lift social care, impoverished social care, up off the floor, to be honest, using the strength that it has in workforce, in training, in standards. I'll, I'll explain to you why. Wigan Council, my local council, is one of our, the opposition's whole person care pilots, as you'd, as you'd expect it to be, our, one of our innovation councils. And I asked Wigan and our local CCG to do a joint exercise where they, between them, found out who were the frail elderly people who were, most, who, were being, who were using council social care and NHS services. And they went away and they came back to me and said, oh, it's 4,976. We know who they are, where they live. And the minute they'd done that exercise, it's immediately got them thinking about personalisation because they now know that they need 4,976 different solutions for each of those people, and that's the journey that they're on. And the question I've asked them to answer your question is, I've said to the council, Wigan, well, why are you paying for these useless 15-minute visits for these 4,976 people? Wouldn't it be better to give some of that money to the NHS providers locally so that they can build in a social component to what they're already doing? And people go, oh, well, maybe, probably it might do. And that, you see where I'm going, that is the kind of thinking that start, needs to start to change, it seems to me, where you've got the council commissioning in isolation from the NHS. And when they start to think, have a shared understanding about those people, I think they'll start to think differently. And in fact, they'll start to think about prevention. And when you're starting to think about prevention, that means they'll have to think differently about social care, because social care is prevention. It's the help with living your life. Great. And we, that's the journey I think the NHS needs to go on all over the country. Can we have the question yeah. there, um, and then can the microphone come down to in okay. front of the speaker? Uh, Stephen Thornton, speaker, uh, Deputy Richard Chair at Monitor. Um, from my uh, memory, it was a Labour government that turned an internal market in healthcare into what I might call a proper market in healthcare. And I recall that when you were Secretary of State, you worked closely with us at Monitor. Um, in trying to design more effective ways of actually regulating that market. And at the time, I didn't hear anything about abolishing that market. Now, today, you've been very, very clear in laying out your views about the market, and it seems to be quite different. And, and I'd really just like to understand the journey you've been on um, that's got you from that previous position to uh, your stance today. Well, I said at the beginning, Stephen, that it was born of deep reflection on that era and our time uh, in government. Um, and yeah, I had to ask the question, would, as I came in as Secretary of State in 2009, what would be the quickest way to get the kind of changes we were going to need in, in the NHS? The remodeling of the NHS, was that going to be done best by a highly fragmented system where every change was contracted for? Or would that be done better, where we give people the space to embrace, uh, to embrace change and a different way of working? And I have concluded that the, the latter is the quickest route to reform, if you give people the ability to collaborate. I, I believe the current uh, context with the Health and Social Care Act takes that up to a new level. And the notion of the Competition Commission intervening to say to two hospitals that they can't take forward some sensible collaboration is, to me, an utter nonsense. Yeah. An Andy, utter nonsense. Can, can I ask, are you, are you clear that you can actually, in a sense, repeal the, that part three of the Act? Because it's, it, you know, there is European, there, you, know, the, you know as well as I do, there's the Enterprise Act, there's the European Commission stuff. And, you know, at least one argument I've heard from lawyers is that while you have things called foundation trusts, which are sort of halfway between the public and the, you know, it's going to apply. 
and that you can't just sort of say we're getting rid of part three of the act, the law will still apply. Mm. You might have to do things like renationalise foundation trusts, so to speak. I mean, is that, I mean have, you, have well, you looked into all that? And are you clear we, that you can actually abolish We have, and just to, as a point I was going to make to Stephen, I, mean, I, I kind of look back, I mean, I, I'm a strong... Autonomy is not the same thing, is it, as, as an outright competitive system. And I think one of the weaknesses in the FT reform is that it probably cemented a hospital-based system, and it hasn't created the context in which good FTs can start to partner with GP practices, with, with uh, community providers and build out and, and collaborate. And I, I have taken advice, and you know, we've had David Locke and others advise us that um, we can uh, use the designation for health under uh, Treaty of Rome and European law. Of, it gets more complicated the more that it's dragged into a uh, into a um, uh, open uh, open market, which yes. is which is what has been happening. I mean, I'm not saying this out of sent again the sentimentality that people accuse me of this morning. I look in a pretty hard-headed way at health systems around the world, and I think if you're talking about evidence-based policy making, as this conference invites us to do, what is the evidence from around the world about markets in health? Number one, I think it tells us that they cost. G20. Liberation. Good enough. Is the, the in favor? Uh. model to understand routes up commissioning and different routes of joining up um, provision how much is do you, do you envisage mandating and requiring people to go and follow a particular model um, versus uh, what freedom will people have if they decide locally to achieve the same goal in a different way? Well, thanks, Ian. Um, I'm glad you've asked this because I, part of my thinking here has been about properly understanding the balance between national or central and the local. What's the national role and what's the local role? And the best way I can describe it is that it's the job of the department and the ministers to spell out the what. What do we want? What is people's entitlement to care? And it's the, then the proper job at local level to take that entitlement and decide the how. How are we going to deliver this 
in our community. And that is the way that I see it working. I'm not in favour of devolving the entitlement because I believe in the end in NHS. And actually, I think that matters to the public too. They hate postcode lottery. That is always at the top of their concerns when they're polled about fears about what's happening to the NHS. So we, we are clearer at national level about what people are entitled to, and that would mean extending that entitlement to social care. Reablement, for instance. I would say that would be a prime candidate to be a new entitlement in a fully integrated system. But then you devolve the how, and you let people evolve different models in different communities in terms of the provision, the balance between the partners, and I think you would want a range of partners involved, voluntary and private. You would not want uh, monop monopolistic uh, provision. Things could be done you know, with federated... or You could do things in a whole range of ways. The reflection being that the last government often tried to do the what and the how. Here's what we want, and here's how you're going to do it. And that doesn't work, as we, we discovered. The current government sometimes does neither, just l let's... Right. Chaos. So that's the best answer that I can, uh, I can give to you. Uh, um, clear about the what, but be open to different ways of providing it. I'm easing into your tea break, but there's so many hands up. I'm going to take two more, and then maybe, as you could, if people want to talk to you afterwards, maybe for a second yep, or two. Of course, yeah. So could we take one there and one here, and then we'll have to wind up, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, Maureen Baker, Chair, Royal College of GPs. Um, I obviously welcome what you say about a shift towards generalism, person-centred care and uh, integration of health and social care around an individual's needs. What I don't understand is why you think that an integrated care organisation led at, by a hospital would move the default position of hospital as a place for care to home as a place for care. Because, you know, hospitals run specialist systems and specialist deliveries, delivery. We're still going to need specialists. We're going to need specialists, we're going to need generalists, we're going to need social care. But I, I, I'm really worried about your emphasis on the hospital's yep. um, role as the leader of integrated care organisations. Well, right, that's great. Can, I, we have, can we have that? We'll just take these two together. Yeah, yeah. Quickly, yep. Sure, thanks. Mark from Health Watch England. Um, firstly, to say your Twitter handle is really long, so it's hard to tweet everything you're saying. <laughs> uh, but secondly... Um, Suggestions on a new one, uh, gratefully uh, Really received. welcome the focus on people that you've yeah. said in whole person care. Um, my question would be, health and wellbeing forums uh, and boards are increasingly bedding down, but also they're becoming a place that is quite politicised. And recent research has shown that actually a lot of the decision making is more politicised than it is evidential. How do you kind of safeguard against that in bringing your vision to life? Okay. Good question. So okay. Politics or rep health and wellbeing boards? And yeah. Any kind of okay, so I'll take Maureen's, uh, Maureen's <laughs> question first. I, what I would say, Maureen, in, in, I would say hospitals and GPs are involved in generalism. Both are doing elements of gen generalist care. What I'm saying is I think this implicit in my vision is rethinking generalism a new model of generalist care at local level and being clearer in terms of separating specialist care from generalist care. Specialist care should increasingly migrate towards the teaching hospitals and the, the centres of excellence. I think we've got to get better models of generalist integrated care at local level. And I would really encourage us not to immediately see this through the prism of the old divides. If the hospital wins, then we lose. I, I think that's, that's the old thinking and I don't think we can carry on with that. The hospitals are currently whether we like it or not, sitting on that money, aren't they? We are going to need them to work differently and think differently if the system is going to change. And I think they have to be given an incentive to move out from the hospital into the community and in the home, but working with other partners in the, in the health economy, working with GPs, as I say, absolutely at the core of that multidisciplinary team at local level, uh, coordinating whole person support, designing those individual solutions uh, for people. And I, as I read it, that is what I thought the RCP report, Future Hospital, was encouraging us to do. That loyalty shouldn't be to primary, secondary, or to hospital over community. Loyalty should be to the public and working around, starting with those people and then making our loyalty to them and then embracing, everybody embracing change in the way that we, we work and provide services. The silos won't do it anymore, in right. my view. And will politicisation put it in well, risk? I, th 
I, I honestly, as I, I don't see it in quite the same way. I mean, I, I think we're all, everybody, and I think Westminster primarily needs to learn to trust local government again. Are we going to have a role for local government in this country or are we not? You know, because at the moment it's on a path out. It's just providing a dwindling number of disconnected services. It'll, councils in Greater Manchester tell me they'll be doing care in bins by 2025 if, if the funding stays the same. Well, everything else will be gone. All of the things that promote good health, like parks, le libraries, leisure centres, they'll, 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 they'll have gone. I think local government is very pragmatic, actually, at local level. Councillors do work across political divides. We're the ones who do the point scoring and the game playing in Westminster. I think you often find more realism and more grounded approach to politics at local level. And I, I just think, at the, the end of the day, if the NHS is to have a more expanded role in terms of whole person care, it needs to be held to account at local level. And there needs to be democratic oversight. And I don't think we should shy away from that. But you, you also have to link it to those other broader public services that affect people's health. And we cannot carry on running what is this narrow medical model. The, 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 the um, final thing I'll just say to you would be a couple of things that might give you some reassurance. We could, of course, place kind of strictures on how much freedom a council would have. So as I said to Ian a minute ago, whole person care, the N in NHS, what, what are people entitled to? I think we should be really tough about saying that has to be delivered. Not, it's not negotiable, that has to be delivered. We should probably be quite tough about saying, uh, you know, how we expect, the model of care we expect for people in their homes, if it can be, delivering those rights that I spoke about in my, in my presentation. Uh, and I think we would also be tough, I would want to re-establish the, um, the profile and authority of NICE, which I think has been chipped away at during this, under this government. So what I would want to do is give NICE an expanded role. NICE shouldn't just look at the health budget or bits of the social care budget. When it makes recommendations, it should look at all public spending because there are certain interventions that can save the criminal justice system in mental health or can save the benefit system in terms of work readiness if, if we're going to help people back to work. NICE should have, in my view, a broader view of pu the public purse. And if it makes a recommendation, if it says that something is worth doing, then it should be done everywhere, in my view. So there are things we can do to make sure that it isn't total freedom. There's freedom about the how, how are we going to provide services, but it's very clear, there's a very clear framework within which uh, all uh, local councils will be asked to work. Andy, that's been fantastic. Huge, broad canvas. Can you stick around for a bit for those who had hands sure. up but yeah, I couldn't get course. to? Yeah, no Can we problem. just say thank you very much indeed to Andy? <laughs>